All right, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Living the Dream podcast. Today on the show, we have Mike Ulmer, who is the, an author and publisher at Catapult Book Writing. Mike, how you doing? Yes, sir. I'm well. So nice to see you. Of course. Nice to see you as well. And we like to jump right in. So if you could start with telling us a little bit more about yourself and what you like to do for fun, that'd be great. Oh, well, as a Canadian, even I'm obliged to say that I like to play hockey. So, because <laughs> we love it down there. Uh, and uh, your Dallas Stars, not too far away from you, did really well this year. There we go. Um, so my thing is, is uh, what I like to do most is help people, believe it or not, I help, love to help people write their books. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just, uh, there's so much negative self-talk that stops people from writing their books. There's so much stuff, Chris, that isn't just isn't, isn't true and we feel that we're not entitled to write our books we feel that our stories don't have value we feel that we don't have anything really important to say and that's not true of anybody nobody yeah. i've done this for 30 40 years i've never found anyone who didn't have a story worth telling anyone mm. i've done ten thousand interviews I've, I've interviewed so many people in so many places olympic athletes and in, in the back of taxi cabs you know uh yeah uh just so many different things and Everyone has a real powerful story to tell, but they mistake, if I may, their story for their conclusions. Mm. No one cares about my story, Chris. Nobody cares about my story. I know that you're in the story business. No one cares about my story. I know this is, sounds a little counterintuitive. People care about my conclusions. Yeah. People want to, to benefit from the conclusions of people who have had different life experiences. Your stories are a dime a dozen unless they lead to a conclusion, in which case they're priceless. Yeah. Mm, I like that. I like that piece of it because it kind of brings attention to like just how social media works. Like you see that in social media, I've been posting daily for this show for yeah. you know 600 something days. I and know. Yeah. And people are, aren't following my story as much as like when I pop off and you know when it's uh, I'm an overnight success in 10 years they'll, they'll be yeah, like 10 years making the making yeah yeah exactly they'll be they'll be following me through and through and you just see that over and over and over again where it's like the story has so much potency when there's a result at the end of it that people want because then they can kind of cling their hope to it I feel like do you think that's accurate or do you think it's for another reason Oh, I think it's just the same reason why if you watch people at a, at a racetrack, they'll lean over to hear what the other person is saying. Yeah. We want, it's the reason why we read. It's the reason why we consume music, art, movies. We want instructions. We want to know because we're built that way. We're yep. supposed to be, we're supposed, that's our reptile brain. We, we're looking for clues how to survive. At, at root, we're all in the survival business. There's an old joke that's told here and probably told there about a, a hunter who comes across, two hunters that come across a bear. And one guy says, what do we do? And the guy says, well, we run. And the first guy says, you can't outrun a bear. And the second guy says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I have to outrun you. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so we're at, at heart in the survival business. And so in our sort of reptile brains, we're always looking for clues, whether it be someone's body posture, whether it be whatever, someone's conclusions. And, and so we, we just, those go inherently into us and we assimilate them. And, and so those conclusions that we can act on are really super and powerful. But if you have a story that leads you to that conclusion, you know, if you have a story, you know, I went hunting 50 times, that hunting story, I went hunting 50 times and that, and, and, you know, I had thought I'd seen it all. And I, my buddy's a really good guy. And we went, and then we turned around we saw this guy and this bear, we've never seen that before. And this is a poor example, but if you have um, a story that leads to that conclusion, then you have something really, really important. So I like to tell people there's really three elements to a great book or a great podcast or a great whatever. And it's this, you have to have a killer idea, killer, uh, uh, what I call a proposition. In this case, like the four and a half hour work week, you know, that's a great one. Yeah. Or uh, 10,000 hours that, you know, the uh, time management for mortals or how to win friends and influence people or from good to great or from, these things are terrific ideas. Uh, and they're kind of counterintuitive and they just grab you right by the throat when you're walking by. But if you don't have the credibility in stating that idea, that proposition, that conclusion that shows how you got all the way there, you don't have the result. You don't have the credibility with the reader. So yeah. you have to show how you went to all this trouble 
And then you have to give some conclusion. So there's three elements. There's a proposition, there's the backstory, and there's a conclusion. Can I give you an example? Go for it. Oh, great. So let's say you are in, I was going to write a book a book for you. And, and um, okay. Can we just stop just for a second? Yeah, for sure. So Timothy, let me just give you a sort of an, an example. I go to write a book and the person's a financial planner, right? Mm -hmm. Not a whole lot sexy about financial planning. Actually, he, this, this person, she works in estate planning, even less sexy. So I would say to that person, what is the one thing that I don't know about estate planning? And she would explain to me how time after time after time, she has people come into her office whose only concern is making sure they don't pay an inheritance tax. They'll make, they'll, they'll move money around. They'll give money to other people. They're, they have other people, you know, implement their will. They'll do all these goofy things because they're obsessed with the idea of not paying an inheritance tax. And yeah. she says, I have had people all the time. They destroy their families. They set up rivalries that shouldn't exist. You know, there's that great line in Moneyball. It's not what the, the money is, what the money says, right? Yeah. They, you know, and by doing this, they, they create dissension and anger in their families. You know, the, the one thing they want them to do with their money is bring them all together. It's the one thing they don't do. They cause dissension okay. and all these things. And, and then the person tells me, and you know what the kicker of it is? The IRS assesses an inheritance fund on about 2% of all death claims. Hmm. The thing that's wrecking your family is completely unnecessary. You're not going to pay the tax anyway. Yeah. You've ruined your family for nothing. For generations, for nothing. That's a pretty good proposition, right? Yeah. The fact that she's seen people after people, after person after person after person come in and screw up their family on the mistaken assumption that they can avoid inheritance tax, which they're constitutionally opposed to paying, that list is endless. So you have the proposition, don't destroy your family for a tax you're never gonna have to pay. You have that woman saying, I have seen family after family after family come in and make this mistake and there's nothing I can do to convince them not to. And then you could have all sorts of ideas and tips, strategies on how to do that. If you have those three elements, then you have a great book or you have a great podcast. I got you. I got you. So it's proposition, story, ideas, and tips. Is that right? That's it. Proposition, backstory, and tips. Anyone needs wanting to write a business book or start a podcast, they need to figure out what that proposition is. And then they need to speak about their backstory and how they got there because that validates the proposition. And then once you've got people all this direction, you want to give them some tips. So one more time on the proposition example in that story, was it that you don't actually have to pay the tax, so don't destroy your family? Correct. I got Correct. you. And it's that piece of everyone figures they have to, who, do you, I didn't know that 2% of, of Americans pay inheritance tax. I didn't know that. Yeah. And those 2% those have so much money, it doesn't even matter. Do you just do you just not report it and that's why you don't pay it? Or do they just do you know the details? No, I'm just curious. You go right straight. If you look, if you Google what percentage of Americans pay inheritance tax, you'll find that the number is minuscule. But people are so and this is more true south of the border, I gotta tell you. People are so constitutionally opposed to paying taxes that they'll do anything to avoid it because they think taxes are Satan's work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in fact uh it's i think that, that feeling is very pronounced in the u.s maybe probably more so than canada but it's just a, it's so i use that example to point out that that person knew something that nobody else knew that was specific yeah. to, to her business she had a great background and experience in explaining it and then she of course made lots and lots and lots of tips so it's the proposition the backstory that led you to that proposition or and and then finally the the third element of it is the recommendations. So let's play with you for a second. Want to play? Let's do it. Okay. You're a podcaster. Okay. What else have you done in your life? I'm a podcaster. I have worked in real estate. That's what I do right now. Yeah. I have, yeah. I mean, I've gone to college. I'm a pretty young guy. I'm 24. <laughs> I've had a life experience here. Where did you go? 
uh, Davidson College. You know, I went, yes. I got recruited to play football there. So played a varsity football in high school, got recruited to college. Um, I've led Young Life. That's another thing I've done. What's Young Life? It's kind of like a Christian um, evangelism, like yeah. schools being a mentor to kids growing. Yeah, um, nice. Yeah, so. What did your folks do? So mom was a nurse. My dad was, yeah. uh, he kind of worked in tech. Then he was a pastor. And then his kidneys yeah. failed in 2010. So he hasn't been working since. Wow. What was it like when, was your dad a big guy, a powerful guy? Yeah, yeah. So, and his kidneys failed. What happened to his kidneys? Just wasn't healthy. I think he was out one night. He was drinking and kidneys failed. Had to go. Yep. So what was that like as a kid, seeing your powerful dad just brought to earth by something he couldn't control? It was pretty rough. I won't lie. I thought I thought he was going to die. He actually did die. And they resuscitated him. So get out. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's pretty wild. How did that change how did that change your life? I actually don't know. I remember the moment, but I don't know how much it changed the course of my life. I think I got really um serious. Yeah, I got really, really serious about stuff. And then I always felt like the clock was ticking on his life. And so I wanted a, I wanted to produce the life that he didn't get to live because of financial hardships and having six kids in the house. And so I got really serious about my stuff because I felt like the clock was ticking, not necessarily on my life, but on his life, on my parents' life. So I wanted to hurry up and produce it. What a great story. What a great guy you are. What a great <laughs> Thank you. story. So how many people have you told that story to? Uh, that's the first time I've told it in that scope. I, I actually didn't know it had that kind of uh, – I've never linked it like that before. Right. But so you learned up close and personal that you wanted to live live the life as a gift, uh, uh, to complete the life that your parents started as a gift to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's pretty powerful stuff. Thank that's you. really, really powerful stuff. So in there, that's why you do what you do. That's your proposition. Live the life to complete the life that your parents have started. Live the life to complete their legacy. Mm-hmm. And give them the one gift. You can't give them life, but you can give them your good life. That you yeah. can give them. And that's yeah. the decision you make, right? Yeah. That's the decision you make. Give them your good life. That's a hell of a proposition. Give them your good life, even mm-hmm. if you can't give them life. And so your backstory is that, that illness by your dad, and all the things you've, you've done in your life since then. You know, uh, and you mentioned, uh, oh, my God, all the different things you did, uh, you, you've done. And uh, you mentioned uh, real estate. You mentioned uh, financial things. You mentioned sports. You mentioned the Christian group. All these things, I think, are at root of, wanting to be that better person and living that life that your parents would be proud of giving them that life. Yeah. And then if I asked you how you did that, well, you would probably tell me that you, uh, when well, you did all these things. And if I asked you for tips, how to do that, you'd probably tell me to create a podcast. You'd probably tell me to go on social media. You'd probably yeah. tell me all sorts of things that you learned in all these different things. You would give me all those tips. Yeah. You're not wrong. <laughs> That's the game. That's the game. What we just did. That's the game. So having that moment of connection with you and you being so brave as to share that moment with me, that's why I do what I do. Hmm. I like that. That was actually the next question. Why do you, what gets you up and keeps you going every day? <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. That's why I do it. Cause I just, you know, I gotta tell you, man, I'm, I'm scared. I'm, I'm, a, I'm tired of writing. I don't want to write any more books, but the conversation we just had, I could do that to my dying breath. I could do that forever because it's yeah. just so interesting. If you have someone like you who's open and brave about their experiences to help them figure that out, that's pretty neat. And yeah. that's why. And so, do how does that do. have you developed some kind of template questions that help people understand their story, or is it always unique to the individual? It's pretty unique, but it's, 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 it's more or less just sort of improvisational. 
You know, yeah. a lot of times you'll say, who's the most important person in your life? What advice did they give you? Well, that's okay. Uh, but mostly, you know, I, I can say I've done like 10,000 of these. You better get fairly good at something if you do it 10,000 times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's, I just have developed, a, um, an, I hope, an ability to engender trust in the person that I'm talking to and to make them understand that I care about their story. And then after that, if, if I have that little bit of buy-in, that little bit of faith from the other person, we always seem to get there at the end. Yeah. Yeah, I got you. Well, that's really cool. And so when did you know that these conversations were the things that like light you up, that give you life? Because you wow. have done some other stuff before, right? Yeah. What a great, what a great, that's a very astute question. And I've never been asked that one. I was always like, I had these great jobs, Tim. I had, I had these, uh, you know, I was a hockey writer. I covered the Toronto Maple Leafs. I had a job where I was a sports columnist. I got to go in all the locker rooms and meet the famous people. And, I, you know, not too much, but I went to the Super Bowl, the Olympics, that sort of stuff. The reason I went to all those places is because I didn't care what the people did. I was just as interested in what, you know, I didn't want to talk about goals or touched on it. I wanted to talk about what your parents did. I yeah. wanted to talk about how they impacted you. So I did everything I could do just to have those conversations. And that journalism is great for that because you sit down in front of someone, they're obliged to answer your questions. They're no more obliged to answer your questions than they are anybody else's questions. I don't have a lie detecting test. Yeah. But the great thing about journalism is you get to ask people those questions just as you're doing now. And I did the writing, which I wasn't bad at. I did the writing just for the right to ask the questions, not mm -hmm. the other way around. You know, yeah. if it was just me, if I could just be Larry King, just ask questions. Well, I might research a little bit, but if I could be Larry King, this is the best part. The writing is hard, right? Do you yeah. like writing? I'm not a big fan. I won't lie. <laughs> I'm right there with you. It's hard. It's hard because it's because there's 50 words that are that will describe something, but there's only one that's the perfect word. Yeah. And so as you get, hopefully you get better you accumulate more words that are almost the right one mm -hmm. and everyone rewrites everyone rewrites again and again and again and again it's it's really hard there's a was a great great woman named dorothy parker she had i think to my i've never heard writing described any better so i can't stand writing i love having written yeah that i was about to say that i was like i really don't like the writing process but i love the idea of creating something and having created something i'm so with you that's great and i got all these books and my kids you know they came and and uh, someone knocked on the door and my kids opened the book and saw a book that i dedicated to them that was pretty cool i can yeah. go to pretty well any library in canada and find my books that's pretty cool that's really cool but um it's that it's that moment of connection that makes it really really great mm. I love it. Well, talk to us about your dreams and goals, vision for your business, vision for your life. Like, how do you see that moment of connection playing out in your daily life going forward? Well, I, this is one of the reasons why I like podcasting, because I get to talk and meet people such as yourself. Yeah. So that's fun. I, I'm, I'm going back into podcasting just as so I can have conversations like this. Um, well, having written a lot, um, uh, I'm sort of shifting my business to, so we've done, we're getting about our six titles coming out this year. And my job is that I, I go to talk to you and, and I'll talk to you for four or five hours. And then I'll, in two months, I'll come back and your book will be done. And so that's pretty cool because uh, for the client, it's great because they don't have time. Those clients have more money than time, right? They yeah. have some money because my service is 25K. It's not cheap, 22K American rather. So it's not cheap, but if they really want a book and they can leverage it in so many different ways uh, in terms of getting speaking gigs and all sorts of different ways, then then I do that for them. Uh, but- Oh, so you literally I, ghostwrite. Yeah, sort of, except for the ghostwriter. The ghostwriter just pretty well says what you say. I don't do that. I, 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 uh, I go way back and I ask a lot of questions and I interview you. And sometimes it's hard, you know, sometimes I had one client and, um, 
he doesn't drink. Doesn't drink at all. Very successful guy. Doesn't drink at all. There's only two reasons people don't drink at all. Uh, one of them is that their parents drank. Yep. And they don't want to. And the other one is that their parents drank. And they don't want to. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> and, and so I said to my friend, Dad. Uh, did you have alcoholic problems in your house? And he said, yeah. And he said, my dad beat me once a week. Mm. And this guy's incredibly successful, incredibly successful. And really, he hadn't told anyone that. I guess it goes back to your earlier question. After a while, you get a sense of where the story is and where the truth is. Yeah. And and so you kind of go back. And, and so sometimes it can be, it can be a little intense because people, you're not going to tell me that your dad beat you up when he was drinking up, up the hop. Yeah. We have to create a rapport. So a ghostwriter wouldn't get there, right? A ghostwriter would just write what this person said. But I get there. And uh, and I do a lot of other research as well. So it's kind of like ghostwriting, but kind of not. But I'm setting up my business now. So um, I can do that. I can have that initial conversation with people. I can do the deep dive. And then I have a, a writer, an editor who can help me write the book. We take the transcript and we can write the book. But the stuff that I like doing is working with clients well, like you who and our price points quite quite early it's quite low it's sixty five hundred dollars and, and what we'll do is then I'll, I'll interview you we'll have the conversation we just had except much 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 deeper and then i'll make a plan for you and show you where your book lives and how you can do it and then i'll give you um a, a transcript of everything we said and where everything goes where and then i got a coach who'll coach the hell out of it with you for for a year and so giving people that voice not just rich people but giving everyone that voice just using their business i really like that that's pretty solid that's pretty solid yeah i like it it's great it's fun like, you said you have two kind of services you have the higher ticket one where you do the deep dive and then you partner yeah. with a writer or editor to take that transcript produce the book in two months for the client that's right then you have a lower ticket one where it's like six thousand sixty five hundred dollars and you yeah. still do the deep dive but now instead of writing the book, you give them the transcript, show them where each part of the, their story goes in the book, and you give them a coach for a year to write their own book. That's right. I That's see. Right. I see. Yeah. yeah. And it's, do you see most of your clientele being kind of coaches or somewhere in that frame, or do you see pretty much all entrepreneurs? Boy, it's so let's see. Uh, so most of the references I have will be people that I that I sort of for lack of a better expression, goes to the book for. So I have an inventor. Uh, I just, I have a, a really great new client named Quadro Kiramenteng, mm -hmm. who's a, an ER doctor in uh, in um, Ottawa. And he says, great, he's a man of color. And he says fantastic things about leadership and and how healthcare and many other institutions are are are, are blind to the circumstances of people who don't look, look, look like them. And he advocates... Uh, for a different kind of healthcare and a different kind of way of looking at the world. Really powerful, powerful guy. Yeah. Uh, I have I just mentioned this inventor named Ron Foxcraft. So if you go to a football game and you hear that super loud whistle, you know yeah. the one that just blows your ears up? He invented that. Wow. That's his. There we and go. He, almost, he almost went broke doing it. He's got great stories. And so that book's really fun. I've got uh, a person who believes in the power of mythology in therapy. And that it's called the myth guided mind. And that if we are to heal ourselves, we have to reach back and look at the classic story uh, uh, types to find our own healing. Mm -hmm. I've got a guy who's a digital marketer and buys Facebook ads. And he was, uh, he was a, a failed Japanese rock star. <laughs> and and the, the title of his book is Drop the Mic Marketing. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> so... All sorts of different things. And we have our first client who's doing what I just described. She's in the equity space. Her name is Lena Seth Sharma. She's in the equity space. And she teaches uh, people how to have inclusive uh, workspaces. And uh, and so I worked with her. And she has this great story. She has this super powerful story. So when she was a little girl, she's of East Indian descent. And, and, when she, and so when she was a little girl, she... Cabbage Patch dolls were the thing. You're too young to remember Cabbage Patch dolls, but they were these goofy dolls that people would give you outrageous sums of money for. They were just this run on Cabbage Patch dolls. Yeah. And 
Um, so her mom took her to the store to buy a Cabbage Patch doll. And the only one left was a little brown skinned Cabbage Patch doll. Yeah. And her mom said, that's okay, we'll come back later. And, and Lena said, no, 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 I want this one. And her mom tried to talk her out of it. And she wouldn't, she wanted that one. Yeah. And so, she, and that doll became super close to her. But when she went back to India, she found there was an enormous amount of racism towards her and that little innocent doll. And that engendered in her an urge to resist. Yeah. And so she's in the equity space, you know? Yeah. And, and that's such a fundamental story for her. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be doing that book. And she's our first coaching client. So I love so, that. Yeah. Oh, I know. It's so powerful. These stories, these fundamental stories are so powerful. I had another, yeah, I have another client. And we're not sure whether we're going to go ahead on her story, but she was this young woman in a small town, and there was two high schools. And this this is a long time ago. There was a men, boys' high school and a girls' high school. And then one day the boys said, We're gonna cancel. We're just gonna have one high school. No talking about anything. Just they just did it. And so there was a lot of opposition. She was a member of the student council at the girls' school. So the the chairman and, and all the big shots, they took her out and uh and they, you know, appeared to solicit what they thought. And the, and the girl said, we don't want, we don't want this. And so at the first public meeting, the chairman and the board said, and I talked to the members of the girl's school and they're okay with this. And she turned to her dad, who was leading the opposition and said, dad, that's not what I said. I didn't say that at all. And her dad, who's like kind of an Atticus Finch character, turned around and said, then you have to stand up right now and you have to correct them. So she stood up in front of her whole town, right? Yeah. And told the chairman of the board, I'm afraid you must have misunderstood what I said. We believe this is a bad idea. She became the girl that started speaking truth to power. Uh, she, she, her dad, her grandparents ran a bakery. She loved business. Yeah. And so she, she went to Windsor, got a business degree. First person to do that, get a business degree. She went to work at Ford. She was the girl that would speak to power. Mm -hmm. But life happens. She had a child. She, her husband was a shit heel. She was economically vulnerable. She stopped speaking to power. She let things slide that shouldn't have been until she couldn't live with it anymore. She quit her job and she went into consulting. She got her voice back. Yeah. Right. She didn't want to write a book because she felt she was a phony because she had lost her voice and was now struggling to get it back. And my point to her was, you're not a phony. We've all lost your voices for whatever circumstances, for whatever reasons. We've had to quell them. The fact that you're now rebuilding your voice is what makes yours a great story to tell. Yep. So, yeah. So these are great conversations and they're great stories. That's amazing. Now she's wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 And so can you only take on a certain number of clients per year? Because I noticed you said you turn in a book over in two months. That's a lot of writing. Yeah, that is a lot of writing. That's why I've sort of uh, I've got a, a brother writer on the team. And yeah, that's, you know what? I shouldn't say two months. It's probably going to be three or maybe even four. I'm, I'm being overly optimistic. But um, but yeah, I have a, a writer on the team that I work with to do a lot of the writing for those long books and a coach who will work with the client that I don't do. This guy's very, very enormous. He's written 60 books and he teaches it, he coaches it, he coaches soccer, an enormously talented guy. And So the answer to your question is we have unlimited capacity. Mm. Come on down, as they say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. <laughs> okay, so for you, it's continuing to podcast, have those meaningful conversations, and you want to do the deep dive conversations while you partner with your writing slash editor and the coach to really write books and hold people accountable to ideas. Um, what are some other dreams and goals that you want to talk about? Well, that's a great one. And, and, and just thank you. That's really articulated beautifully. I want to be with them when they when they make the connection, when they figure it out, what, what I tell people is that we're going to charge you X amount of dollars to help you have clarity and understand your life. We're going to throw the book in for free. Mm. Right? Yeah. The real service is you figuring this shit out. Right? Yeah. The book is the bonus, but and, and it's a great bonus. It's wonderful. But I think what we're really helping people with is, is have a clarity and, and learn the story you need to tell every day for the rest of your life. Mm. So in your case, that story that we talked about 
about living your own life for your parents and and and, and having a living legacy for them. Yeah. Now that you've seen how it can end, that's a super powerful story. And in your case, that's the story that we would tell. But the other stuff in terms of my other dreams and goals, I have three kids. I have a spectacular wife who's extremely indulgent. Uh, I said to her, you're the best person I know. And she said, well, you're right up there too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. She's way smarter than I am. She was. She said, I, I was looking to hang a bike in the garage. I said, this is going to require a whole new tool. And she said, well, then you're just the man for the job. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a spectacular wife who's just brilliant. And I have three yeah. spectacular kids. I have a great job. I um, I work for myself. I do exactly what I want to do. Uh, I've had, you know, I started out in a small college at 20 years old, went to a, a weekly newspaper. I worked my way up. I've done stuff that I never dreamed I could do. I've had such a fortunate, ridiculously fortunate life. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm just immensely grateful. Uh, you know, Tim, when you're your age, you're in the acquisition phase. When you're in my age, it's about keeping what you have. Mm -hmm. And that's often why people of my age are so conservative because it's all about hanging on to what you've got yep. instead of, of just opening new doors every day and finding new boundaries. And we all get that way when you get older, maybe because your body kind of breaks down or a lot of times you get older. I know a lot of people. I probably know 50 people that have died. How many people you know have died? One, two. I know two. Okay. I know 50. Yeah. And so. And I don't even. The people that I know have died are like, they're ancillary to my life. Like they weren't personal, very close friendships or anything. It's just like. And some were. Some in my case were ancillary to my life. Maybe the people who I visited, the kid up the street. Yeah. But I can make 50. So when you get to, I'm 63. When you get to that, it's really easy to feel marooned or hard done by. A lot of times the people, your school is gone, the school you went to is gone, the neighborhood you went to is gone, your friends don't live there anymore. It's really easy to feel estranged from the world when yeah. you get old. And so I'm so ridiculously lucky in that I have this opportunity to talk to you and other people, sometimes for money, to, um, to explore that. So I, I, there's nothing left for me. I've had such a spectacular, lucky life, and I have three brilliant kids and a great wife and a great family. I've, if they took me now, it's been a home run. Yeah. And so gratitude is something a lot of people struggle with. When did you get yours? Has it happened in the past couple of years? Were you born this way? Because you seem like a really grateful dude. Well, I think it came to me when I was 30. My life changed. I've had two really big things that changed for me. The first time when I was 30, I had can I got cancer. And I had testicular cancer, which is the best kind to have, believe it or not, because the rate of recovery is very, very high from testicular cancer. And I always feel obliged to mention that I had two, I had two kids after that as well, just, just so you know. And so, um, and when I had, was sick, I learned that I could talk to anybody and ask them anything because they were people who had nothing to hide. Yeah. And 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 I found there's so much good humor in on cancer wards that you wouldn't think. And so much honesty. And you know, I, I lost a testicle. <laughs> That's a great sentence. But I gained um license to ask people real questions. So yeah. that was the first one. The second one where I, I, I learned gratitude was I got to the top of the mountain. I was a sports columnist for the Toronto Sun, but I was sick. I didn't know it. I had bipolar illness. Mm. And so I, so when you have, but most people that are, so unipolar is just sad, right? But bipolar illness is different because you kind of have really dramatic mood swings, but you go to the doctor when you feel sad. So the doctor gives you antidepressants and you get higher, right? And so yeah. then you crash a little bit, then you go back to the doctor <laughs> until the balloon is so full. Eventually it's got to scatter around and hit the floor empty. And that's what happened to me. I sort of blew my career up 
uh, because I slapped a guy on an airplane. I'm the most gentle person ever. Uh, but I slapped this dude on an airplane, the guy I work with, as a matter of fact. And I got arrested. There's certain phrases, Tim, that get your attention. When someone says, how do you plead? It's fairly safe to think that you've made some poor choices. Okay. <laughs> that phrase, how do you plead? That ought to get your attention. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so that terrible event uh, gave me the chance to stop and to look at my own sanity or lack thereof and to recast my life and i went to work uh, for the people that owned the raptors and maple Leafs for seven years and that was great and then i left there they left me they had some shut they had some organizational changes and they did the right thing i was redundant uh, and they were very gracious to me uh but those two things were about uh two moments where i think i learned the power of appreciation because both of them seemed terrible and both of them turned out to be extremely powerful beneficial things that happened to me yeah yeah i got you and so when you stopped the dude huh? did you get charged with assault like what would you get arrested for i feel like you must have slapped him really hard to get i arrested. know well you're not this was before 9 11 this was in 2000 no it wasn't before it was so it was after 9 11 so uh, they were kind of uh, curious. They were kind of uh, coming down on what you could do in an airplane, slapping a dude. I knocked his glasses. I, I don't like to tell this story because I re-victimized this person who did not have this coming. Yeah. There's no excuse to do what I did. There's no there's no excuse. And, and what I did was monstrously wrong. And I changed the arc of his life. And I changed the arc of mine. And um, it was a terrible, terrible, terrible thing that I did uh, to him. And uh, I still have grave, grave regrets over it. But one of the hard things about asking for forgiveness is what happens if it's not granted? Yeah. You know, you look at the 12-step uh, the program in AA and you make your best efforts to, to, you know, to say you're sorry and to make restitution to that person. But sometimes the answer is no. You're on your own. That person is under no obligation to give you contrition or to give you, you know, yeah. forgiveness. So what do you do after that? You know, that's that's one I consider quite a lot. Mm. Yeah. There we go. Well, thanks for diving into that with us and sharing that. That was a good question. It was a good question. Yeah. And so the, the perspective shift, though, like a lot of people would go through that and they would just be bitter. So why the gratitude out of those two things? Well, thank you. My mom was a very grateful person. She uh, lived in a retirement home and she died at 100. And she made her best friend in the world at 98. Mm. Imagine that. Yeah. Best friend in the world at 98. Um. I just think gratefulness is the one thing that we're all missing. And I know it's missing in my life because I'm nowhere near as grateful as I should be. I might sound grateful talking to you, but lots of times I struggle with that. Um, but it's our best. Gratefulness is, 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 is humility. And humility is the best quality in us. Because if you're humble, you can't be angry. And if you're not angry, then you can be grateful. Yeah. I love it. Well, cool. We're going to skip over a couple of these questions, mostly because I don't know how much they would speak to your story, but I am curious about this one. If there were one or two people you could meet right now, this could be a specific person or a type of person, and they'd really help you take that next step towards your dreams and goals. Who would they be and how would they help you? You. It would be you because mm -hmm. uh, you've moved me forward in a way, uh, in a powerful way. To have this time with you i i don't have to meet anyone i've met lots of famous people I, I don't have to meet jesus i don't have to meet anyone i just want to be with the person that i'm sitting across from so the answer is you there we go i like that answer well cool we got our thriving three and then we can kind of wrap this up talk about anything yeah. else you want to talk about what's your favorite book movie or podcast pick one of the three Oh, my favorite book is uh, John Steinbeck, Cannery Row. 
Although I really love the boys of summer, which is just a, a baseball book. Cause I really love baseball podcast. I'm listening to Julia Marie Dreyfus's podcast, which is really good uh, talking with wiser women. But the only thing that bothers me is that she never follows up her questions. And as an interviewer, the third question is where the, is where the gold is. Yeah. That's the third, the third, because so you do this, you follow up your question with another question. Right. Mm-hmm. I've, I've noticed it. You follow up the question with another question. And then the next question, that's where the gold is. Yeah. Because at that point, the, the person, the, the, the subject is too deep into it. I can't bullshit you anymore. Right. I might uh-huh. be able to bullshit you the first one, maybe the second one, not the third one. Yeah. And that's where the truth lives. And so I, I'm listening to her podcast, which is really good. She's talking about she she knew Sam Cook. I'm a big Sam Cook fan. Uh, and she was she was on stage in Elvis's 68 comeback special. I don't know if you've ever seen that one. That's where he's wearing black velvet, black leather. Mm-hmm. Elvis at the peak of his powers. And and so she didn't, Julia Marie Dreyfus didn't follow up as to what was it was like to be, because it wasn't on a piece of paper, right? It wasn't, she had a list of questions and it wasn't on it. She didn't do what you do. She didn't let her gut take her to that, that thing. Yeah. And uh, that frustrates me. So, but she's really, really good. So that's a great podcast. And what's it called? And Talking we, with Wiser Women? Yes. It's, just, it's really good. Yeah, it's really good. There we go. So that's that's probably my favorite podcast right now. Okay. And one more time on the favorite books. Yeah. Ran past them for me. So Yeah. Um, so I love John Steinbeck. John Steinbeck, though, is such a good writer that he discourages me. Mm. And, and that's, I really, really fight against that because there's always a faster gun in the West. Yeah, because John Steinbeck is so. There's this fabulous video of of, of Prince, uh, and it's I think it's like the 1998, 2000 or two, whatever it was, Grammys, and George Harrison and Prince are being inducted. And in the rehearsal, they're going to play "While My Guitar Gently Weeps," the great Beatles song that George Harrison wrote. And so it was Jeff Lynne from Yellow, who you might not know, and his guitar player, and Prince, and a couple other guys. And in rehearsals. The guy stepped on Prince's lead part. So he played the first solo. And then he went to play the second solo. You don't play over Prince's solos. He's a very competitive guy. (laughs) You don't do that. So everyone jumped in and said, oh, no, no, no. There's just been a little mistake made. And we're going to smooth this out. That's what rehearsal is for. And Prince said, okay. Okay. And then he went. And then he came back. And when it was time, his guitar solo, the second guitar solo, was probably, perhaps the consensus would be, the greatest guitar solo ever. Mm. It was so good that Prince threw his guitar up in the air and just walked away. Whoever was going to catch it was going to catch it, right? He was a very competitive guy. It was marvelous. But if you watch, if you watch the video, mm. there are guys like Tom Petty, who was a big star, Jeff Lynn, who was a big star. They're enjoying him being great. They didn't feel challenged by him or somehow threatened by him being great. They just love being great. And that's the thing about writing. You're always going to find someone who's better than you. I have, you know, John Steinbeck. The challenge is to be as brave in, in saying what you want to say, how you want to say it. As You're never going to be as skilled as, but you can be as brave as. Yeah. As the person. So I love John Steinbeck. I love, I can't read most of his stuff. It's too powerful. I love... Um, I really love this book, The Boys of Summer. It's a mm-hmm. beautiful book on baseball and Jackie Robinson. Those are probably two of my favorite books. Yeah. There we go. Well, cool. What is one way you like to take care of yourself? Well, I've just signed up for Pilates. Solid. Oh, man. God did make, not make this body for Pilates. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I've started intermittent fasting. Hmm. Okay. I've I've started gone back to the exercise machine. Yeah. Uh, I bike. I do a lot of meditation. Yeah. I, I meditate at least half an hour a day, often more. Uh, I meditate first thing in the morning. I think meditation is really, really, really powerful because it's a it's a great anti crazy tactic. Yeah. I don't uh, I don't drink very much, uh, if at all. I don't use any drugs. Uh, 
because I don't want to be piecing my personality on the floor the next day. I'm having a hard enough time keeping all this shit together up here. Yeah. I don't need to take any unnecessary chances. <laughs> yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. So I don't, I don't do any of that stuff. I don't really have a, a spiritual uh, belief to, to, to cling to. Uh, but I find those things help me stay on track. And, and the other thing is just great friends. I mean, friends are so powerful and and again in your life in your time you probably have 50 friends and i probably have six yep and and my advice would be to you would be hang on to those 50 (laughs) Uh because they're going to be 35 but uh but friendship especially at my age i'm 63 is a really powerful powerful thing as i said my mom 68 best friend in the world you know yeah that's the power of love yeah. I love it. Tell us a bit more about the meditation. When did you start it? How long you've been doing it? What is it like when you do it? I've been doing meditation for probably 20 years. It's it's fundamentally misunderstood. When you imagine you're fishing and you cast a line out, right? Mm-hmm. The 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 process of bringing the line in, that's meditation. So, if I ask you to sit and concentrate on your breathing, just close your eyes and concentrate on your breathing. You're probably going to last about 10 seconds, yep. 15 seconds. And you're going to start thinking about the groceries and stuff like that. People think that meditation is having a blank mind. It's not. Meditation is the act of recognizing when you're thinking about something that you don't want to think about, in this case, the groceries, instead of, instead of the breathing. So when you do that, you have to cultivate an awareness to say to yourself, Mike, you were going to concentrate on your breathing. What do you do thinking about the groceries right now? Or what do you do thinking about the maple leaves? Or what are you doing thinking about this? And I can last eight or 10 or 15, maybe 20 seconds. And then invariably, because my mind is built to do this, it skitters off somewhere else. And I'm taking the line. I'm bringing the line back in. And I'm going to stop. And then it's going to go again on its own. And I'm going to bring the line back in. The more you bring the line back in, the more you cultivate the ability to see that it's out. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And the ability to see that it's out and then to say, okay, I'm going to correct this is the ability to look at your own behavior and more importantly, your own thoughts. Mm -hmm. When you can look at your own thoughts, when the thoughts in you aren't one thing, when you can look at your own thoughts somewhat objectively and, and put a little bit of reason and understanding into this, it's very powerful. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, I like that. I've never heard it explained like that. I've heard it explained many ways, but not casting the line, bringing it back in. That's it. People think that's when you're doing the meditation, when you're bringing it back in. Anyone can cast it. It's when yeah. you're bringing it back in. That's the work because it's hard. But then you come back and your ability to do that will be better and hard, better and better and better. But I've been doing it for 20 years and I don't think I'm measurably any better at it. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what do you notice? What do you notice your uh, common line cast out thought is? Like when you're oh, it, really being distracted, what is it? In meditation, it can be, um, so what you do is you con- it's called an object. So in my case, I might concentrate on my breath or I took transcendental meditation. And I have a mantra, a, 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 a series of sounds I use in my head, or sometimes I use music. It can go anywhere. Invariably, it goes to the past or something I have to do. It can go anywhere. But what you have, it's like you have this kind of child that's that's doing this little thing. And you go, no, 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 come on back. You're not scolding the child because then you make a big deal of it. You're saying to the child, which is you, come on back. Okay, come on back. Okay, come on back. And you just do that again and again and again. And after a while, the child just stops bothering leaving. (laughs) He goes, oh, you're going to call me back every time. I'm just going to sit here. And that's really nice because then you go into another totally different thing away from your conscious thought that's almost a state between sleep and awake. It's extremely pleasant. You don't always get there. Most of the time you don't get there. But when you do get there, you're just on this razor's edge between sleep and you're so relaxed and ideas are flowing back and forth. And I get my best ideas in meditation. I think it's because my body is looking for, my mind is looking for any excuse to get me to stop. that will go, oh, I got a great idea. And then I got to stop or remember to remember or write it down. Yeah. But yeah, but all my best ideas come from meditation. Solid. Well, yeah, my- it's fun. I appreciate you, man. That's all we got for you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you for calling. I was so touched that you that you think of uh, reaching out. Yeah, yeah, of course. Is there anything else you want to chat about before we sign off? 
No, only to say that I think your story is so powerful. And that, that I wonder if for you, maybe to narrow your focus, you might want to think about narrowing focus and finding how many other people live for the same reasons that you do and have the same values that you do and have had similar experiences than you have. I like your topic, stories, because it's so wide open. But your story is so great. I wonder if, if maybe if I could encourage you to reach for that touchstone with other people, what the rewards would be for you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's actually something I've been thinking about. It's part of the reason, um, because I love talking to people about their dreams and goals. And that's initially what I thought. I thought I just loved talking to people about their dreams and goals, loved hearing their stories. And I do, I do love encouraging people in that way, but I love encouraging people in that way because of the pain I felt as a child. And then, how I saw my parents live their life. And so I'm really excited about sharing the experience with people and then walking through it with them. Like that's the part that really gets me up and gets me going. And I think finding people, finding that tribe, finding that like dream 1000 or whatever it is would be beneficial for both me and those people. Right. <laughs> um, oh, I, yeah. So I still think so. There's lots, and I don't mean this disparage it. There's lots of real estate podcasts, you know. There's lots yeah. of them, uh -huh. and there's lots of football podcasts. There's lots of podcasts. Just period. What you're talking about is different, yeah. and what you're talking about is unique to you. It's as you that podcast, that idea is as unique as your fingerprint. Yeah, right. That's yours and yours alone. So fine as you say your tribe. That's pretty neat stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I wish you luck with that. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Oh, my it. pleasure. My pleasure. Awesome. Well, Mike, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Great fun. Of course. And if you guys are listening to this and you loved what Mike had to say, make sure to check him out. All the links to do so will be down in the show notes. Thank you guys so much for watching. We will see you on the next one. And on that note, we're out.